I'm going to be in Nehemiah chapter 1 and talk about realizing you got a great need. Nehemiah 1, chapter 1 and verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So it took these certain words. As soon as he heard these words, he realized there was a great need. So Nehemiah is burdened because of the remnant who are in great affliction and reproach. And he recognizes there's a need to go back and rebuild the wall and the gates. So sometimes it takes sorrow and heartache and bad news to cause you to realize there are some things lacking in your life and you need to get some things fixed up. Here are some things that's going to make you realize there is a great need. The first one is great affliction. In Nehemiah 1.3 it says, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. Maybe things are going really good in your life for a time, but then there's going to come great affliction, and it's going to change everything. It's going to make you realize that you need to fix something, that you need to change something. Hananiah and some men of Judah explained to Nehemiah that the remnant over in Jerusalem, they're in great affliction. He said the gates are burned with fire. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. And when Nehemiah heard this, he sat down and wept. And he mourned and he fasted and he prayed. Sometimes you have to recognize a great loss. You have to experience a great loss before you can recognize that you have this great need. So he had the right reaction. He mourned and he fasted and he prayed. He took it serious. He sat down. And Nehemiah, he becomes a better person after he heard the bad news. Ecclesiastes 7.3 says, Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. So when you realize that your life is pretty much broke down before you, and your gates are burned with fire, that's the right reaction. Get as close to God as you can. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you. Weep, mourn, fast, pray. Do whatever you got to do to get closer and closer to God. Sometimes the more you lose and the worse things get and the harder they become, the closer you actually get to God. Just like Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said, his strength is made perfect in weakness. It's like the weaker you get, the closer you get to God. You know, somebody said, why does God allow me to go through this stuff? Well, maybe he sees that you get in great affliction. You're going to have nobody else to turn to but him. A man needs to approve himself in afflictions. 2 Corinthians 6, 4. In 2 Corinthians 6, 4, it says, but in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, and distresses. You approve yourselves going through afflictions. They shouldn't move you away from the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 3.3 3. Your afflictions should not move you away from the Lord. They should move you towards the Lord. It says in 1 Thessalonians 3, 3, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. If you're a born-again believer, then you should expect the afflictions. And all things that you suffer for God for down here, you're going to get rewarded for on the other side. You need to endure the afflictions. 
1 Peter 5, 9. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 9, it says, Whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So you resist the devil. He's a sober, he's vigilant. You need to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You resist him. And you realize that the same afflictions, your brethren are going through the same afflictions throughout the world. Afflictions made Nehemiah want to go to the city. Think about that for a minute. The afflictions made him want to go back to Jerusalem. Our afflictions should make us want to go to the city. Revelation 21.10 This city in particular it says in Revelation 21, 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Our afflictions should make us want to be out in eternity somewhere with the Lord and seeing new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adored for her husband, and make you want to dwell there instead of setting your affection on things down here. That's why afflictions come, to make you realize that you want out of here. To make you realize that it's not that good down here. Some people say, I'm, I'm not ready to die. I'm not re ready to, for the Lord to come back because I like it down here. Well, wait till great affliction comes. Then you're going to realize that you have a need for someplace better. Afflictions made Nehemiah want to go to the city. Our affliction should make us want to go to the city. So to recognize your need, you might have to have great afflictions. And you also need, number two, the God of heaven. You need the God of heaven. You need the same God that Nehemiah turned to when he heard the bad news. When you recognize your need, you're going to need the God of heaven. And he's great and terrible. It says in verse 5, Nehemiah 1, 4, and 5. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He recognized his need for the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God. You need the God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So you got a lot of gods that aren't in heaven. And you got a lot of gods that aren't great and terrible. They are counterfeits. They're distractions. They're your roadblocks from the, de the devil's deception bag to keep you from recognizing your need of the one true God. You got all these false gods that are pushed in your face every day to keep you from recognizing your need. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, And whom the God of this world hath bonded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. When you approach the God who is great and terrible, as Nehemiah calls him, you realize you are small and feeble. You realize you'd need something outside of yourself, and you need help from another world. Nehemiah is praying to the God of heaven because he knows he's the only God who can supply the need? Just like Philippians 4.19 said. In Philippians 4.19, it says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Nehemiah is going to the only person that can help. And when you get in great affliction, you realize that he's the only one that can help. He can give you what you need to make it through this life. And if, if you have a need then you need to do this thing. Get his attention. Nehemiah tells the Lord to let his ears be attentive and his ears be open. In Nehemiah 1.6, it says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, 
both I and my father's house have sinned, he says. So you get his attention. Well, how you do that? Just start praying. And, then, and you become guilty before him. If you want to get his attention, become guilty before him. See, Nehemiah takes full responsibility for his sins. He says he confesses the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. He goes on to explain that they are corrupt, haven't kept the commandments, the statutes, or the judgments. He says in verse 7, We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. You see, you need to draw nigh to God, and he's going to draw nigh to you, James 4, 8. And the first step in getting back in fellowship with God is to confess your sins. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to be like the publican who said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, in Luke 18, 13. David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned, in Psalm 51, 4. Paul started out saying, I am least of the apostles in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He ended up saying he was less than the least of all saints. Then went on to call himself a wretch in Romans 7, 24. And he finally calls himself chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1, 15. The more he grew in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the more he recognized his need. If that doesn't make you recognize your need, then let 1 John 1, 8 which says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Come guilty before God. You came guilty before God when you needed to be saved, and then you do a daily confession of sins, not for salvation, but for fellowship. And if you're out of fellowship with the Lord, you come guilty Confess your sins. He's faithful and just forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now when it comes to your standing, your standing is as perfect and righteous as the Lord Jesus Christ if you're saved. But for that daily fellowship, you mess up, you just come to the Lord and, and confess that sin and then you just keep going. And not focusing on your flesh and how bad your flesh is, but focus on how good your standing is. Your standing is as righteous as Jesus Christ. And if you focus on that, you're not going to have to worry about the devil telling you, well, you're not good enough to talk to God. Well, you are good enough to talk to God because you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you. In Hebrews 4.16, it tells us that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you recognize the need, you come to God humbly and make your request. In James 4.3, James 4.3 says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. The verse before that, Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. You recognize the need. You need to make your request. And you need guidance from Scripture. That's something else you need. Guidance from Scripture. You need the God of heaven, the great and terrible. You need to get his attention, get guilty before him. And you need guidance from Scripture. Nehemiah goes to the word itself in order to get a prayer answered. In Nehemiah 1, 8 through 9, it says, Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. See how he goes back to the scripture to get a prayer answered. We need guidance from the word. We don't know what to pray for. So glean your words of prayer from the word. Nehemiah says, Remember the word which thou commanded thy servant Moses. In Nehemiah 1.8. If you don't know what to pray or how to pray or how to approach God, then learn the Word of God and you'll figure out what to say. Then you will have scriptural prayers. 
It's like it says in 1 Peter 4, 11, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God is what God said. So then you're talking God's language. He, Nehemiah said, Remember the word which thou commanded thy servant Moses. For example, he said in James 1, 12, If you endure temptation, then he's going to give you a crown. He said there is a way to escape in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So when you're in a situation where you're tempted and you're looking for a way to escape, quote those verses to the Lord and say, Lord, I know that you gave a way to escape and you can get me out of this temptation. So please help me. That's a scriptural prayer. You need guidance from the words of the Lord. Glean your words of prayer from the Lord. And the next thing, Give all glory to him. You need to give all glory to him. Nehemiah tells the Lord that he is the one who has redeemed them by his great power and strong hand. And he's the only one who can give Nehemiah what he needs. In Nehemiah 1.10, Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Give all glory to him. His great power and strong hand. Tell him about his great power and strong hand. You need him because you are without strength. He's the one with the great power and strong hand. Romans 5, 6 says, When we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. You're without strength in the flesh. The world's strongest man couldn't touch the power of God or our arm wrestle, the Lord's strong hand. Anything bad you do is your fault. And all praise has to be given to him for any good thing that he's done through you. It wasn't in your strength. It had to be done in the strength of the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 1.31, it says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Anything good that God did through you, all glory has to go to God and not you because it wasn't by your strength anyway. So you need... To give all glory to him. His great power and strong hand. And you need granted mercy. In Nehemiah 1.11. Nehemiah 1.11. It says. O Lord I beseech thee. Let now thine heart be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. And to the prayer of thy servants. Who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee thy servant this day. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. You need granted mercy. Nehemiah is beseeching the Lord that he would find mercy in the eyes of the king that he's about to go face. So you need to gain favor of the king. You need mercy from God, the king of kings, and you need to make him merciful. You need to make you need to make men you need God to make men merciful towards you. It, it reminds me of praying for those in authority so that we can quietly do the work of God. In 1 Timothy 2 one through two where it, where it talks about praying for all men. All men everywhere. You need to pray for them. In 1 Timothy 2, one it says, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You need to recognize the need of prayer. You need to recognize the need of praying for other people. Not just because they need prayer, but also because the people around you can keep you from do can try to keep you from doing what you need to do. And God can put thoughts in the heart of men to make them be at peace with you. Proverbs sixteen seven. You know, Nehemiah is praying that he's gonna soften this king's heart so that he can get his favor to go back and rebuild the walls. And Proverbs 16, 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. The people around you can become a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul talks about a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet him. And only the Lord's strong hand can remove the thorn and give you mercy in the sight of men. So you need granted mercy. That's what you need. You needed mercy when you got saved. 
You needed grace when you got saved, but you need grace and mercy even after you're saved. So you need granted mercy. Nehemiah heard there was a need, and he instantly began to make progress towards going back to rebuild. And in your life, you are most likely lacking something. You're lacking something. Look at it. Examine it. Don't wait until things are in ruins before you go back and fix the problem. The quicker you go and fix this problem that you've got going on, and the quicker you go back to your first love, the less things there will be to repair. So Nehemiah recognized his need. It took great affliction. It took him hearing about the gates being burned and the walls broken down. It took him thinking about the God of heaven and how great and terrible he is. And then he finally realizes he needs to get the Lord's attention, come guilty before him. And he comes to him gleaning the words of his prayer from Scripture. You glean your words of prayer from Scripture itself. You need guidance from Scripture. Give all glory to Him, His great power and strong hand, and pray that He'll grant you mercy and gain favor in the sight of the King and the sight of your enemies. Let's go ahead and just read the chapter one more time. It's such a short chapter. But really get it in your head. Nehemiah 1.1 1, 1. The words of Nehemiah the son of Hekeliah. And it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left to the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left to the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. See his reaction there to the, to the need. He's found out there's a need and that's his reaction to go straight to the God of heaven. Now verse 5, And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So if you want to prosper, recognize your need, you need the God of heaven, turn to him and to his word. And then you can be prosperous and have good success.